You can be seated. Over the past few weeks, in various places and at different times, I've had people walk up to me and say, what's going on over at Central? And they've heard about it. And Sandra and I talked with a pastor here in town last night who said, tell me if this is true or not. You got up on a Sunday and announced that tomorrow night we're going to have a prayer meeting and so many people showed up that the building was packed and there was standing room only. Is that true? I said, that was true. And it's been that way ever since. He said, how do you explain that? And I don't, it came from the Lord. I said, God is visiting us. This is a time of visitation from the Lord. And after I thought about it, I said, that, that really is the truth. The Bible talks about times of refreshing that come from the presence of the Lord. Those picked out moments, those divinely appointed uh, encounters with God where he really does come and say, I have something for you that will take you deeper into me. It happens to churches, it happens to families, it happens to individuals. And I would like to say to those families, with all the compassion that a pastor can have, while we are having this visitation as a church, it could be simultaneous with your family. And I know lots of parents are really concerned about their kids getting enough sleep for school, and then it moves into we got to get our kids in the best schools and we've got to provide them the best sports opportunities. And there's no end to it. To the, to the degree that you go after that, you neglect what really does matter. If your children have never been in a spirit-filled prayer meeting, I don't care where they end up in life, if they don't have a walk, a close walk with Jesus and a solid faith, it amounted to nothing. And I am telling you that during this time of visitation, it would behoove every family in this church to say, we're going to make a sacrifice. While the winds are blowing and while the waters are stirred, we're going to make a sacrifice because there is something more important than straight A's, my friend. And it's to have a child that has a heart for God and feels that God's hand is upon their life. This is also true of individuals. Some of you of late have felt a pull, a, a nudging, if you will, a massaging of your heart. Folks, that's God trying to visit you right now. You kind of slough it off or think, well, you know, I got in a good service or I'm just spiritually uh, uneasy right now. No, no, listen, listen. God is trying to visit you. He's trying to do something beyond what you think or even desire. I have learned over the years, in fact, this past week, the Lord has awakened me at night. In times past, I would lie there and pray, but I understood this week that God was visiting me. That, that he wanted me to make the sacrifice of getting up and going down to my closet. He had something to tell me, and he did. And I am so very thankful that I chose to get up and sacrifice sleep because God visited me. And I'm telling you right now that in this church, there are families and individuals that God has placed his finger upon and said, this is your time, this is your place. I'm coming to visit you. What will you do with my visit? How will you handle this interruption in your life? 
Jesus sat on a donkey outside of Jerusalem just before he went in and he wept and said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill and persecute the prophets. How often I would have gathered you under my wings as a hen does her chicks, but you would not because you do not realize the time of your visitation. You don't realize that God has come, that you can't carry on the business of life as you've always done, that I've come to indeed interrupt it. I've come to mess it up because you need more than you need more business and more money. You need me more than you need breath and I've come to visit you. But they didn't know it. They didn't acknowledge it. And instead of receiving him, they crucified him. And I'm telling you that throughout the scriptures, when you, when you see what Jesus is doing, he is not coming to impose himself on people. He's coming to say, may I have a visit with you? And if you will take an advantage of that visit, your life will never be the same. I can go through example after example. There was the little man called Zacchaeus who was a, a rich man and he heard that Jesus was coming through Jericho and something stirred him. There was a visitation spirit that was beginning to hover over him. He had always heard of Jesus, but now Jesus was coming through town. And Zacchaeus was a man short of stature. He was too little to look over the crowd, but he knew something was different and his heart was buzzing, it was stirred. So in order to see Jesus, he ran ahead of the crowd and climbed up in a sycamore tree so that he could hang out over the limb and see Jesus. That was his time of visitation. And when Jesus got to where Zacchaeus was, he didn't look at the crowd. He looked at Zacchaeus and said, come down, for today I must abide at your house. I've come to visit you in your own house. And I'm telling you, if Zacchaeus had not had a heart for Jesus, had he not realized it may be now or never, had he not climbed up in a tree and even faced the laughter of his critics, he would never have had Jesus sit down in his bedroom, in his living room, in his kitchen and converse with him. He knew the time of his visitation. There was that woman with the issue of blood. You know all these stories, church, but look at it. See it as a time of visitation and appointment with God. She had been sick for 12 years. She was losing blood every day. She had been to every doctor and was none the better. In fact, she had lost all her money trying to depend on the medical world. But she heard Jesus was in town and a sense of a visitation came upon her. And when she got to where Jesus was, he was so surrounded and thronged by the crowds, she knew she could not get near him without some violent act where you don't care what people think. They may even think you are rude and inconsiderate, but in her heart, she knew it may be now or never. She could not afford to let Jesus pass by and not visit her. So she elbowed her way through the crowd. She pushed and she shoved and when she saw him from behind, knowing that must be the Jesus she's heard about, she lunged and when she did, she swiped at him and her fingers touched the hem of his garment and immediately, the Bible says, the issue of her blood dried up and she knew that she had been healed. Then Jesus turned around and said, somebody touch me. Who touched me? And the crowd, the throng said, lots of people are touching you. He said, I know that, but somebody touched me with faith right then. I felt virtue go out of my body. And the woman, and the woman said, I did it, Lord. He said, woman, you don't have to, anything to be ashamed of. I came to visit and you received me. Your faith has made you well. There was blind Bartimaeus. You see, he had been blind all of his life and they would place him beside the road every day so he could beg and 
Occasionally, kind people would drop coins in his cup. And this particular day, even though he was blind, he could sense that there was a stir, a sense of visitation. Somebody new was coming through. It was not the idle chatter he was used to, not the normal conversations that people had as they went back and forth in front of him. Today, something was different. Oh, holla. I'm telling you, something's different, friend. And when he asked several of the people, what's going on? What do I hear? They said, a man called Jesus is headed this way. And when he heard that, he started immediately because he knew this could be his one chance. This could be it. The opportunity of a lifetime. And he immediately began to cry out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Now be reminded that he was wrapped in a blind man's robe. See, blind people in those days had to wear wraps that identified them as handicapped or blind. Notice what it said in the Bible. And as he cried out, the more the people said, don't bother him. You're making a fuss. You don't have to do that. Don't embarrass us. This is what makes me want to preach to the church right here. Because what you, some of you don't know, who are high and mighty spiritually, some of you that are stayed in your ways and unbendable and unpliable and, and you're staunch and conservative and unemotional, you get upset because a brother over here whose life is all to pieces might cry out for help. You get embarrassed. You don't want to bring your friends. You don't even feel comfortable yourself. But let me tell you something, my brother. Church is not a place to sit and just think. Church is not a place to sit and just belong. Church is a place where a blind man or a sick woman or a short man can cry out and Jesus will visit them. You don't know what people in this congregation are going through. You don't know the hell families are going through through. You don't know what their children are doing to them. Some of you have got it really made and your life is not that stirred up so you can't comprehend people that can't pay their bills or a person that lost their house or is about to lose their car or doesn't have a great doctor to go to. You can't comprehend that. But people like that are sitting in this congregation and Jesus is passing by and they know this could be their visitation. So don't tell me to be quiet. Don't get embarrassed because I yell. Just in case, let me tell you one more time. I came to Charlotte yelling, and I'll go to glory yelling. I came to this town with a burn in my heart, with my coattail on fire. I came to this town living on my knees, and that's exactly how I'm going to leave this world. But until I do, I'm going to preach Jesus and him crucified. I'm going to preach Jesus and the visitation that he wants to bring to us. Wait. The more they told him to be quiet, the louder he got. I am not advocating for foolishness in this church. I'm not saying anybody can act any way they want to because you've got some unbalanced people in this congregation. And you've got some people that want attention in this congregation. And you've got people the devil sent to this congregation. And I understand that. But I also know that where there, there is a hungry heart, there is a Jesus with a basket of manna. I know that when God is moving, the devil will try to counterfeit it and distract. I'm not going to let that keep me from crying out to Jesus, Lord, have mercy on me. 
But you've got to see something here. In each case, Jesus said it was their faith. So when Jesus came to blind Bartimaeus, he said, what do you want me to do to you, for you? Lord, that I may receive my sight. You know what he did immediately? The Bible says he threw off his cloak that says I'm blind, that identifies me as a handicap. Jesus said, stand up. He threw that off first because he was saying by faith, I'm getting ready to see. I'll no longer be handicapped. They won't call me a blind man anymore because the time of my visitation has come. Oh, the thing that's changing my life has come my way and I am ready. And Jesus said, your faith has made you whole. Then there were 10 lepers. As Jesus walked through town, they stood up on the hill, 10 of them. You see, they weren't allowed to interact with society. They had a very infectious and dangerous disease called leprosy. So they had to mark themselves as lepers. And anywhere they went, they had to cry out, leper, leper, so that people could run away from them. Ten of them got together. It was a leper colony. And when they saw Jesus walk, walking by, they said, Jesus, have mercy on us. And Jesus said, go your way and show yourself to the priest. Do you understand that that's what the law required? That in order for you to be declared whole, a priest had to examine you to make sure there was not one whit of leprosy on your body. And Jesus, who didn't come to destroy the law but to fulfill it, said to those ten men who cried out for mercy, Go show yourself to the priest. And the Bible says, As they went, they were healed. Because they believed what he said. Because they obeyed his commandment. They didn't stand there and argue and say, what do you mean show ourselves to the priest? We still have skin falling off. He said, go show yourself to the priest. And they immediately wheeled and went towards the priest. And as they went, they were healed, every one of them, cleansed from their leprosy. And when they were in their shock and awe, looked at their skin and each other, they began to rejoice. Nine of them said, I'm going into town to eat. I'm going to a restaurant. I'm going into the shopping area. I haven't been able to do this in years. I'm going to go find some friends and have a good time. But one said, not me. And he ran back and he fell down at the feet of Jesus and began to worship and praise the Lord. And Jesus said, well, didn't I heal 10? Where are the nine? There's only one that's come back to thank me for what I've done. And then while the man was worshiping, Jesus lifted him up and said, your faith has made you whole. You might have gone there and got cleansed, but coming back, you were made whole. Because he understood that was his moment, his time of visitation. It made all the difference in the world. Now he's whole. He has more than they have. They got cleansed. He got saved. They got physically healed. He got spiritually healed by the hand of the Lord. So here's the question this pastor has brought to this congregation today. Do you know that this is the time of your visitation, sir? Can you sense that God is stirring you to some degree? And I implore you, don't miss this time of visitation. There's a beautiful story in Luke 24 on Resurrection Day. Two men, two disciples of Jesus are walking on the road to Emmaus and they are discussing the scriptures and they are talking about the recent events in Jerusalem and they are bewildered by the fact that some women 
came a little earlier and said, we went to his tomb and it's empty. And all of a sudden, a third guy shows up. They don't know where he came from. They didn't hear any footsteps behind them. But this third figure shows up and they said, well, howdy. He said, howdy. And he said, what are you guys talking about? Well, where have you been the last three days, they asked. Are you a stranger in these here parts? Do you not know about this Jesus of Nazareth? How we thought he would be our Messiah and our Redeemer, but they killed him? Jesus said, let me start and give you a lesson. And he began to teach from Moses to the prophets and the Psalms of himself. And as they walked, he taught and their eyes were open, and sun was going down. The sun was going down, and when they got to a cross point, the Bible says he would have gone on. He would just keep on walking. He was going to see if they wanted more. He was testing him to see if they wanted him to stay and linger with him. He would have gone on. He would have left them with all the knowledge they had at that moment and just gone on. But they had enough sense to say, oh, don't leave right now. Something's burning inside of us. Why don't you come home and be with us tonight as we eat? And the Bible says he went home with them and they put bread in front of him. And as he broke the bread, their eyes were opened and they said, it's Jesus. We saw him do this in the upper room. That's Jesus. And he disappeared. Let me tell you, friend, had they not recognized the time of their visitation, they would have missed the revelation of a risen Jesus. I come to you this day, and I say to you, oh God, as the pastor of this church, I do not plan to miss the time of his visitation for Central Church. I do not, but I'm also talking to you. Mom, Dad, individual, young person. This is a time of visitation in your life. Don't miss this because you're busy. Don't miss this because the kids need to get home and get their rest. Don't miss this because it's inconvenient. It's a Monday night. Or don't miss this because he woke you up at night and you really need to rest. Don't miss this because it just doesn't fit in. Let me tell you, when he visits, he does not come at a comfortable time. He comes when you are most tied up with yourself and burdened down with your problems. And he says, I'll either let you carry them and work it out yourself, or I'll sit down and break bread and show you who I am. Just don't miss my visit. Stand with me, please. Hey, Sandra, do you know, she can verify this, for six days, I prayed and sought God for a message. Six days. I'm talking hours untold. And I'm talking in a closet and I'm talking on my face. And when I went to bed last night, I thought I had it. But when I woke up this morning, that's what the Lord laid on my heart. Right there. Brother, what you heard this morning did not come out of my mind. It came out of my heart. And I'm, I'm, I'm hallelujah. And I want you to know something. What you heard today was not a planned and prepared sermon. You've heard an invitation from the Lord Jesus Christ not to miss this time of visitation. So I'm just going to ask, who doesn't want to miss it? Who doesn't want to miss it? Who wants what God has ordained for you to have? Slip, your, slip both hands up in the air and say, Lord, Lord come, visit. come visit. My door is open. My heart is open. Do what you will in my life. Would anybody like to walk down here? Just come on down here and stand with me as we, as a church, say to him, visit us. Don't let us miss this, Lord. 
Don't let us miss this, God. Who sings that? You sing it? Come on. We might as well have a little prayer meeting right here, right now. A little formal acceptance of the invitation of Almighty God. the Spirit of God to pray this prayer. For those of you who inside are jumping, hungry, longing, but your religious upbringing just won't let you let it loose. They didn't do this in your church. And even your family members that say they are Christian would not understand you getting shouting happy, getting filled with the Spirit. But it's there, it's just in there and you, if you were alone, you might just lift your hands and cry out, praise the Lord! But you're in a crowd, you're amongst people. But do I need to remind you, had blind Bartimaeus listened to the crowd, he died blind. Had the woman with the issue of blood let the crowd stop her, she would have died in her blood. Brother, you can't let people or your religion or your upbringing or your background get in the way of this appointment that God has set up for you. All the earth
may just continue this. Most churches don't even worship the Bible way. Has anybody read the 150th Psalm lately? Praise Him with the symbols, high sounding symbols. Praise Him with stringed instruments. Make noise, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. All ye lands, serve the Lord with gladness. Come before His presence with thanksgiving. Enter into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Your body does not belong to you. It belongs to Jesus. And that body is supposed to be a walking, living, breathing, praising sacrifice. The breath in your lungs does not belong to you. He gave you that breath. He put it in there. You have no right to hold it in when he designed it to come out. If you have breath, if you're alive, you're supposed to be praising the Lord. From the ends of the earth, well, I cry out unto thee. I bless you, O God. I'm not going to miss it. Jesus, I stand and officially, publicly say before this congregation, we will not miss your visitation. We will not yield to the requirements of our life. At the expense of the health of our soul, we will not miss this visitation. How many surgeries have you had for cancer? Uh, I've had cancer 13 times. 13 times. I'm having surgery Wednesday to take my stomach out. You're having surgery Wednesday to, to, to take your stomach out. Do you believe? I certainly believe. Amen. Somebody get me some oil. Where's the oil? Where? And I want somebody that has enough faith not to hope God can do it or just ask. Come up here and let's believe that whatsoever things we desire. You say, but is it, is it God's will? Let me tell you something about God's will. Listen, all of the promises of God are yes and amen in Jesus Christ. You believe it? Okay, here, here. I'm going to anoint you and the whole church is going to pray for you. How about that? And I want us to pray militantly. I want us to ask God in faith in the name of Jesus Christ. I touch my sister with this oil according to the word of the Lord. We ask you, Lord, to let her feel the healing virtue of Jesus Christ run through her body from her head to her feet. Just as you heal that woman, you can heal this woman. We hold it up in Jesus' name. We declare that God is a healer, that there is nothing impossible to him that believes. We believe it in Jesus' name. Say amen, somebody. Get ready to sing, Lauren, if you would, please. Anybody else feel the virtue of the Lord in here? Lord, fill everybody with the Holy Spirit even as we stand here right now. We confess our sins first of all for those things that we've been negligent in, for knowing to do good and not doing it. Forgive us for all of this, Lord. Wash it away by your precious blood. We confess our sins in the name of Jesus and believe that you've washed them away. Now, we come, Lord, unhindered, unblocked, to lift up holy praises to God from our lungs with your breath through our bodies. We bless Jesus.
does strange and unusual things. You don't have to come up and be anointed to get healed. Karen got healed in the pew, right? right. Tell us, them, what you told Sandra and me. Okay, I know y'all don't have all day, so I'm going to try and make it brief, but um, I have been struggling with anxiety like every day for six years ever since my husband passed away. And I mean, like every morning I would wake up, no reason I'm not worried, nothing is wrong, but I have anxiety, like almost all day, then it goes away at night, I sleep fine, and it was just weird because it was like, this isn't normal anxiety, I mean, why, you know, why is it like this? I mean, y'all, I tried everything that was legal to <laughs> make it go away, and I mean, everything, and finally, when we came on Monday night, the first thing the pastor said was, are you here expecting God to do something? Yes. And I mean, I just felt it all over me. And I was like, yes, yes, I believe that God can heal me. I mean, I got so tired of asking people to pray for my anxiety to go away. And then there was this young man up here that has stage four cancer, and I thought, and I'm worried about anxiety. I'm not gonna go forward, but God healed me. I mean, healed me. Like, I woke up the next morning, and it was gone. Amen. He can heal anybody of anything, anytime. Great is the Lord. 
Nothing is impossible with God. Let's not miss this time of visitation. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, my strength, my redeemer. Amen. I'll see you tomorrow night at 7. Better come early to get a seat. Death could not hold.